He's the one that does the clothing. Yo, thank God we've got a pastor who prays the Lord. If I'm an overachiever, I begin to rock Elisha with the faith. gave the war of God. And, and be a man of God. And they would just, oh, I just want you set free. Christ from the dead lives no, in. No, that this preacher told you the truth. Suggest align yourself with CGIA and let's go forth and take our communities for Christ. Welcome to CGIA today. Changing lives through ministry signs and wonders is one part of what CGIA is doing across the North American continent through ministers and individuals that are proclaiming the word of the Lord. Stay tuned coming up on today's broadcast was to begin to kill the prophets. That's what jealousy does. It destroys the voice of God in our lives. Now I'm talking about the devil being in the kitchen. It destroys the voice of God in our life. And many times it comes in so subtle and it's so deceptive that, that we rationalize it. Well, they did this to us and this happened. Now, anybody love Jesus today? Pastor Bob asked me to speak again this year. So, well, my, what would you like me to talk about? He said, well, just something to encourage the people. And uh, I thought about all the wonderful, encouraging messages that I have. All of the high motivational, jumping up and down messages that I have. And I really want to share one of those. And I am. It's just going to come in a different format. I've learned in life that many times we can be anointed like we talked about last night, but we can be on a short chain. And we can't, we can't fulfill our purpose because we're bound up. Last night, how many of you heard Dr. Phillips last night talk about the cat head biscuits? How many of you were here last night, you heard that, yeah. Well, I, I have a similar background, and I grew up on that. I understood everything he said. But I want to flip the biscuit over today and pick up on his message and talk about the other side of the biscuit. You see, while God is needing you, while God is pouring in, and he's putting oil in and buttermilk in and flour in and all of that, there's something else that's trying to happen while that process is going on. The devil is trying to infuse some ingredients into that dough while God is working on you. Jesus said it this way to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now leaven is influence. So while God is working on us and God is taking us from point A to point B and God is building our lives and God is taking us from one test to another test to another test, which basically is the definition of life. While God is doing that, the devil is also trying to get in the kitchen. And he's trying to get something in that dough of your life that will cause it to not be what it ought to be. To cause it to be a little sour. To cause it to be a little bitter. To cause it to be a little mad. To cause it to be a little angry. To cause it to be not as effective as God wants it to be. I want to take you to Exodus chapter 20 verse 17. You can memorize this real quick. You shall not covet. Now, this word covet means to have a desire for something that does not belong to you. Now, sometimes people confuse greed with covet, but they're two different things. You see, greed is simply the desire to have more stuff, any kind of stuff. Just want stuff. Everybody say stuff. stuff. We all want stuff, don't we? Is this thing working? Anybody here, anybody here got any stuff you want? Anybody want more stuff? Anybody got stuff in storage like I do? And yet I still go buy more stuff. Okay. Greed can be manifested as I want more stuff. But covet is not only the desire to have something that is not yours. It is also the desire to take away from a person who has it and keep them from having it. See, covet is much deeper than greed. Greed says I want everything I can get. Covet says, I want everything you have. Now, I'm going to bring this down to practical pastoring, so stay with me. Not only do I want it, but I don't want you to have it. And if I can't have it, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that you don't have it. And some of you right now are starting to think of scenarios in your ministry where you've encountered that in your life. Covet is expressed in the human action we call jealousy. Say that with me. Jealousy. And my goal in these next 20, 30 minutes together is to break 
the chains of jealousy. Not only jealousy that we may have on the inside of us that we don't know about, but the jealousy that has inflicted pain on us by other people being jealous of what we are doing. Let's look at the root of jealousy. Covet or jealousy is the root cause. I'm going to say something. It's just my opinion. But I believe covet or jealousy is the root cause of all sin. I believe it is the original sin, and I'm not talking about in the garden. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Notice how many times I will is in that verse. Verse 14, I will ascend above the, le the heights of the clouds. Now here it is. I will be like the Most High. Now this is a clear account of how Lucifer, through his jealousy of God, lost his place in heaven and became known as Satan. In this chapter 14, verse 12, is the only place in the Bible where, where Satan's name is defined as Lucifer. It's the only place. And Lucifer means morning star. Satan means opponent, adversary, arch enemy of good, or accuser. Has anybody ever had to deal with the spirit of an opponent, an adversary, an arch enemy of good, or an accuser in your life? Has anybody ever accused you of something you didn't do? That was one of the most astounding things to me when I became a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. My daddy's not a pastor. My daddy's a coal miner in the West Kentucky coal fields. I'm a Kentucky boy, although I'm in Missouri. Somebody had to go. And uh, my dad went to church. My parents took me to church. I grew up in church. I, I got saved when I was a young boy. I served God. I went to the Hillcrest or whatever it is. Uh, I can't think of the name of it now. The uh, Crestwood campground as a teenager. Uh, up here in Louisville, and uh, uh, got filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, I, 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 I wanted to serve God, but I wanted to serve God as a businessman. I wanted to be the guy buying the stuff for the church. I wanted to, I wanted to be the big businessman, and, and that's what I tried to do the first 10 years out of high school while I was serving in the church as a youth leader. And uh, it was it was during during that time that 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 I, I just I, I, I quite frankly I hadn't met many pastors I wanted to grow up and be like so I wanted to be a businessman, but but when God finally got a hold of my heart and I gave my heart to God and totally my life to serve Him and became a pastor I had this weird fantasy that when you became a pastor everybody would thank you for being a pastor they would thank you for for forsaking all of life that it had and to and to serve God and give up your wonderful life and be a man of God and they would just oh they would just people would just enter me to the grocery store they would thank you and and ever I just thought that's how it was well y'all know that's not how it is right some people are accusers. And you know, I don't mind being accused of something I do. If I've done it, I'll admit it. I'm not ashamed of it. If I did it, I'll tell you. I'm a country boy. I'm not bashful. But to accuse me of stuff that I haven't done. See, that comes from the spirit of Satan. He is an accuser. Now, jealousy has three roots to it. If you'll listen fast, I'll talk fast. Here are the three roots, and we're going to swing back to them. The first root of jealousy is dissatisfaction with God. The second root is desire to have what God has not given you. The third is a decrease in your honor for God. Now, notice all these connect with our relationship with God. And this is a young man shared earlier about prayer. If, if, if our relationship with God fails, our relationship with people will fail. If our relationship with God is not right, our relationship with people won't be right. If we'll steal from God, we'll steal from people. If we'll lie to God, we'll lie to people. And it's not just preachers, it's anybody. You see, if, let's look at these three roots of jealousy. First of all, dissatisfaction with God. Now, most of us have probably, if we'll be honest, have had a moment in our lives when we feel like God is not blessing us in the same way he's blessing somebody else. I'm going to let that soak in just a second. We, we, we feel like that, that, that he shortchanged us just a little bit. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I've gone to conferences like this before when I was much younger. And sometimes I've come away with a great word, and I was so excited, and I got a good idea and everything. But there have been times I've left a conference like this mad. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I heard some guy get up, 
talk about all what God had done from him, and his church was growing, and they tripled since January. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, all right, well, am I a stepchild? <laughs> is, there, is there something about me that, I mean, God, I've given my life to you. I'm doing everything I know to do. I took a half-cut pay and salary to pass this church. God, I, I, I drive no junky car. How, how, come, how, how come that's happening for them? And it's not, now, now, don't look at me like that. We've all had that little bit now. Come on. We, we've all been there a little bit. And the guy gets talks up about, you know, God just blessed me so-and-so, gave me a citation for whatever jet. And what I'm thinking, I don't even have an ultralight. It's because that's all I need right now where I am. Now, now, see, now, now, what I'm talking about, this is how subtle the enemy gets in the kitchen and starts to put a little of his own flour, his sour flour, into, into the kneading that God is doing in our lives. And now, now, in order for God to accomplish what he wants to do, we have to be receptive, willing, and obedient to him. But in order for the devil to accomplish what he wants to do, we have to be open and receptive to him. We can resist the devil and he'll flee from us. But sometimes if we're not resisting that little thought of, well, God's blessing them, but he's not blessing you, and it comes into a dissatisfaction, quite frankly, if we are not satisfied with where we are, with what we're doing, what we're saying is, I'm dissatisfied with God's provision and placement in my life. Now, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that you're supposed to say, well, this is what I got, this is all I'm going to have. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You should always be striving for everything that God has for you and the blessings of God. In the same process, like Paul says, I have learned whatever state I find myself to be content. You know, I'm old enough, I've learned you're only going to sleep in one bed at a time. You're going to only eat one plate at a time. You're only going to drive one vehicle at a time. And most all of them are going to get you there. And so rejoice in where you enjoy the moment. You know, there's an old country song that's kind of, the byline of it is, you're going to miss this. It talks about seasons of life, and it says, yeah, but you're going to miss this. Don't miss it. Enjoy where you are. Don't allow dissatisfaction with God to allow the enemy to put something in you. Why don't I have a house like that? Why don't I have a job like that person? Why don't I have a church like them? Why don't I have a ministry like that? Why don't I have a car like that? See, Satan helped Eve to grow this first root in the garden. In Genesis 3, 4 through 5, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan was saying to Eve, God has something you don't have. God's keeping something from you that you could have, but he's, he's keeping it from you. It's forbidden fruit. What he was doing was cultivating a dissatisfaction in Eve in her circumstance. What circumstance should she have? A perfect one. Her, her world was perfect. You see... You can be in the perfect place. And if you listen to the voice of the enemy, you can become dissatisfied with the perfect wife, the perfect husband, the perfect kids. The, I know there's not a perfect church, but, but, but the good church that you're in right now. See, if you become dissatisfied with the church you're in and the place you're in, you're, only, you're, you're on the road to walking away from perhaps the place of miracle that God has for you that he wants to bless you in. Every place has challenges. Every place has people. Every place has stuff. Every place has problems. God sent you there to lead through that and to build his kingdom. But if you become dissatisfied with God, you'll go from place to place to place to place to place to place. You'll never develop roots enough to do much of anything. The second root of jealousy is desire. The desire to have what God has not given you. Now, this is different from the first root in that it deals with specific things and wants in life. It's not a general dissatisfaction. It is a specific dissatisfaction. It is the desire to have something that God didn't intend for you to have. In Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 37, it tells us a story of James and John, and they came to Jesus, and, and their mother came to Jesus, great men of God. Their mother came to Jesus and said, 
we want you to do whatever we ask. That's a good prayer, isn't it? And Jesus didn't rebuke them. He just said, uh, what do you want? Well, when you come into your kingdom, verse 37, grant us that we may sit on your right hand and on your, either on your left hand in your glory. Now, this was a desire that they had, but it was not their assignment from God. The best way to keep this root from growing in your life is to simply take that to the altar and put it there on the altar. Check out my time here. See if I've got time for a story. God, uh, the first church that I, I pastored, uh, I, I pioneered it. Now, that was before we learned how to launch churches. Now we launch them. But, but 30 years ago, we pioneered them. And, and it's different. I don't know what's different, but first of all, I didn't know you could ask anybody for money. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know that. So we pioneered this church, my wife and I. We never pastored a church. We never served on the board of a church. We'd been late. Interested in becoming ordained through CGI this fall at the National Conference in Louisville, Kentucky? Visit CGIAmericas.org or call 502-964-3304, extension 1216 for more on how you can be credentialed through CGIA. to kill the prophets. That's what jealousy does. It destroys the voice of God in our lives. Now, I'm talking about the devil being in the kitchen. It destroys the voice of God in our life. And many times it comes in so subtle and it's so deceptive that, that we rationalize it. Well, they did this to us, and this happened to us, and that happened to us, and the district presbytery, and these people, and that pastor across town, and all of these things, and we begin to rationalize. We start stirring our own spoon in the soup that the enemy's putting pepper in, and we start participating in that instead of saying, wait, now, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute here. This, this sounds like, smells like, walks like, quacks like, and I think this is something I need to stay away from. But see, it's so, it's so subtle in our lives. Now, here's the thing about it. If we don't do that, we become chained up with jealousy, and we don't even realize it. And we pray, oh, God, anoint us today. And, oh, God, help us today. But we're walking and we're preaching like this. We've got chains around us because there's something on the inside of us that the enemy has been able to infuse in the kitchen. And because of that, we've got that there. You've got to get free of that. We've got to be free of that. I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Orlando. Uh, a few months ago, I oversee a church down there, and uh, it was Saturday night. They didn't have anything going on. I was preaching Sunday morning. My wife and I drive by, driving around. We drove by First Baptist. It's a mega church down there, and so we just drove in just to you know drive around. My wife likes to look at buildings, and there's people going. And she said, "Let's let's go in." So sure. So we go in. They're having a Saturday night service, and we go in and we sit through the service, and and, and then we left. Well. A couple months later, I was home. I have fellowship with the, the pastor of the largest Baptist church in town, the largest Methodist church in town. And we get together, and uh, it was really the three largest churches. And so uh, we, we got together, and I mentioned to him I was down in Orlando and went to First Baptist on Saturday night. And uh, I didn't tell him it was like paint drying, but, it, 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 but, but anyway, I, I, I went. Did I say that? This is not on tape, is it? So, anyway, he says, yeah, and he told me the story. He was on staff there when he was in college. And he told me the story about how they voted to move from downtown out to where they were. And he said, you know, when they voted to move out there, 500 people got up and walked out of the church that day. And he said, you know, even though they built a great building and the church has grown since then, that pastor never got over it. And a little voice on the inside of me said, don't want to be like that. You know, there are things in our life that happen sometimes. There are Judases. I'd like to take this a little further, but I'm just going to wrap it up. You know the story of Jezebel. You know what happened to her in the end. And her end was the same as the end of Satan. Her, her end was the end the same as Satan. You see, what do you mean, Pastor? 
Number one, it was quick and severe. They threw her out of the window, boom. It was quick and severe. Number two, it was public and repulsive. Number three, it ended any chance of repentance and recovery. That's the same thing that happened to Satan. It was quick and severe. It was public and repulsive. And any chance of repentance was gone. If you have been the victim of somebody else's jealousy, if you've been the victim of a Jezebel, a Judas, an Absalom, or pick any other name in the Bible out where people have tried to destroy the leadership and in your church, if, if you have been a victim, let me tell you, you are not a victim. You are a representative of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and when I was, I used to pray this prayer when I first got in ministry. Oh, I want to be a, have a ministry just like Jesus. I must have skipped a bunch of the Gospels. Because, because, you know, the only part I remembered in that prayer was laying hands on the sick, walking on the water, doing miracles, the crowds coming, he spoke with authority. That's what I want. But then through life I began to realize, wait a minute, Jesus had another part of his ministry. Uh, he, he, he was ridiculed. He was constantly accused. The Pharisees were following him all the time, wanted to accuse him of something, and it was good stuff, but yet they would turn it into bad. He had a Judas. For, in three and a half years of ministry, I figured, well, if you have one every three and a half years, oh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> but that's what made the ministry of Jesus. And oh, by the way, the, the pinnacle of Jesus' ministry when he's, he said, it is finished. I don't care if I'm hanging on a cross upside down sideways or anywhere. I don't care what. I just want to one day get to that point where I say, it's finished. I have fulfilled my purpose. I have completed my task. And I'm not letting anybody in my kitchen. Nobody is messing with my dough. Nobody's going to put anything in my biscuit that I don't want there, that God doesn't want there. And if you will determine in your life that you will not allow any bitterness, I know it hurts. I know what it means to go home and cry all night long. I, I, I know what it's like to wake up every morning with that person's face on your mind or that situation. I, I know what it's like. You Do you know what it's like? Are you feeling what I'm talking about right now? I, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to work my fingers to the bone and, and, and it doesn't seem like anything's happening. But the word of God says God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows or a woman sows, that they will also reap. And when my fingers are bony and they're bleeding, I say, thank you, God, I've got seed in the ground, harvest on the way, the crop's coming up. I'm not determined in my life by somebody else, but by your promises in my life and in my church and in my family. Can you say in a better amen? amen. Hallelujah. I just want to pray for you real quick, Carol. If you've ever experienced, if you've ever experienced and maybe you're experiencing it right now. And you feel like that other people's behavior is putting you in change and is restricting your ministry. Jesus wants to break those chains off. I like what one of the ministers, one of them said last night. that There's some things that are, I think Walter said it, some things you don't need counseling, you need deliverance. Just to break those chains. And you know, I find that they break real easy when we just recognize them and say, here it is, Jesus. I don't want to be like that pastor first Baptist in Orlando that never got over it. I'm going to stay over it. I don't intend for it to ever get on me. I, I wish I could teach a while on how to, how to not let it get on you. But you can. You can live a life free. That's what Jesus did. He walked through the crowd. When they're trying to kill him. He just walked through the crowd. On the same night Jesus was betrayed, 1 Corinthians eleven, twenty-three. 23, on the same night he was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it and broke it. He could have got up and said, I'm done with you crew. I'm going to have a high speed come apart right here. No. Jesus did not allow, allow, listen, he did not allow the pain of the moment to keep him from the purpose of his future. And you and I can't allow the pain because the pain is part of the process. That's part of the kneading. That's part of the working up the biscuit. That's part of the heat in the oven. 
And by the way, you may be in the oven right now and say, oh, I'm ready to come out of the oven. No, you wait till Jesus takes you out. Remember, he said, well done, not medium rare. So let him pull you out when you're done. And when you're done, everybody's going to want one of those biscuits. That's why they're coming to this young man. That's why they're, they're, they're coming to Brian. That's why they're coming here and all these other pastors and, 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 and all these individuals. That's why people come because, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, you represent the Lord. If you feel like you need a couple of chains broken off of you, just stand up right now. I just want to pray with you all over the building. I need some chains. People, people have tried to put chains on me. People have tried to bind me up. People have tried to. Their behavior, their actions, it's getting into my heart. It's getting into my spirit. It's getting into my mind. I need it broken off of me right now. Is that everybody? Put your hand over your heart right now, would you? I want you to say this out loud, and then I'm going to pray over you. I want you to confess Jesus Say it, Jesus. You're my Lord, not them. You're my example, not them. You're my deliverer. And I commit and I submit my desires, my issues, my wants, everything before the throne. Set me free. Break every chain that someone's tried to put on me. Remove every ingredient out of the biscuit of my life that Satan has tried to put there. And in the name of Jesus, I boldly say, I am free. I am free. Shout it like you mean it. I am free. I am free. I'm over it. I'm through it. I'm on top of it. I'm free. I'm free. Now, Father, I pray, God, this very moment for a wisdom, anointing, and guidance of emotions, hearts, minds, in every way, Lord, for every one of these individuals to walk from this moment forward, God, in complete freedom in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, that from this moment forward, they will keep the devil out of the kitchen in their lives. They will guard it at all costs and never allow, again, any ingredient to come into their life, subtly or otherwise, for them to fulfill their divine purpose in every way, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Order today's sermon in its entirety by calling the number on the screen or visit cgiamericas.org for ordering information and to see today's program again. Order your copy of the CGIA 2014 Implantation Conference today online for only $30. It includes all the ministry and miracles of the CGIA National Conference from 2014 plus more. This is a limited time offer, so visit cgiamericas.org and order your copy on DVD today. Join us next week at the same time for CGIA Today and stay connected with us online and on Facebook and Twitter.